Hi, I'm Mackenzie. And I'm Tom. Um, I am originally from uh, San Diego, California. Um, I was born and raised there. Um, I grew up going to church with my grandma in the summers when I would go and study, um, spend some time with her, but never really dove into Christianity myself. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in, I actually grew up in St. Charles, and I came from kind of, not a real religious family, but Catholic family. We went to church a couple times a year, barely graduated high school, and then uh, decided to do the military route. Uh, figured I needed to do something with my life, so I uh, jumped on that uh, straight out of high school, left for boot camp, uh, went over to San Diego, and actually that's where we got introduced. We met through friends who loved to party. That's where we were. I was 19 years old at the time. Um, he was 21. A month into our relationship, found out that we were actually pregnant. We barely knew each other, and here we were trying to figure out kind of like what the heck we were gonna do with our life. So just got married. Haven't been back long. Um, she's pregnant. We've known each other for a few months, and now I'm leaving again for Afghanistan for the second time. And I remember one specific event oh, when I was overseas that gave me a little bit of perspective. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, somebody's looking out for me. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't know how I made it through the day, but somehow I'm still here. I come home, uh, married. Now I have a two month old daughter and life kind of got turned upside down for me. In October, we moved to Hawaii, so I think we've actually been married together with a daughter for three months, and now we're moving to Hawaii. Um, so I think when our daughter was around 18 months, we finally decided to start uh, trying for a second. And it took us a couple months, but I did end up um, getting pregnant. And um, it was exciting because it was like, you know, we got to be excited for it, whereas our first, it was just a shock and, you know, it wasn't the most exciting time of our life. Um, so got pregnant with that baby. Um, and then a couple weeks later, we found out that the baby did not have a heartbeat. Um, and so I went through a miscarriage. Um, and again, it was kind of just like, what the heck? You know, like, why is this happening? The same week that um, I recovered fully from my miscarriage, um, we ended up conceiving our son. You know, there's just there's just little signs everywhere around us that um, God was trying to wiggle himself in our life. But we still didn't realize this. So yeah, uh, I know when we were kind of phasing out in, in Hawaii, we made the decision, actually the day that Braden was born, we made the decision that uh, we were gonna come back to St. Louis. Um, and that's kind of where Robbie and Alexis came in. And they're like, you know, um, we have this amazing church that's actually right by your house. Um, that we've been going to for a couple years and we'd love if you guys just kind of came and checked it out um, No pressure at all. You know, we knew from the second service was over at our first white flag service that we we're like, yeah This is it. This is for sure. Like we're, we're sticking around. I'm like, what's the next move? So uh, I, I don't even really think we had a conversation about it. We just both kind of mentally were like, yeah, let's go get baptized and I think it was after starting point. We're like, okay, well Let's, let's do it. So it was on Valentine's Day that we ended up getting baptized. And I know I reached out to Robbie uh, a couple weeks before that. Uh, I think it was after starting point. And I was like, hey, man, we, we want you guys to baptize us. I mean, if we just had anything to say to Robbie and Alexis, it'd just be thank you. Um, I don't know without them um, really being that guide for us to this whole spiritual journey that we have been on for about a year now. Um, if we would be where we are. It's it's impacted us in such a way. I mean, it's 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 hard to even explain uh, without knowing exactly where we were before and seeing us now. But yeah, I mean, I just, we appreciate you guys. You guys are like a model, a model couple for us. And you you have the relationship that, that I kind of look look for having with her. And we're, uh, we're so appreciative of it. And uh, yeah, we love you guys. Well, welcome everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. I wanna welcome everybody that's in person and everybody that's watching online. We're so glad that you're all here for week two of our series, 
Go tell, and I just love that story once again. I'm just so thankful for the the Parr family and the way that they are able to tell a story about how their friends, the Broch family who love Jesus, invited them or talked to them about Jesus or told them to come to church. You know, however that goes down, we are trying to show you through these testimonies that, man, you have the ability to impact a person's life and their destiny when you go and tell them about Jesus. And so we've got one more video to show you next week, and, and we just love those testimonies because in this series, what Go Tell is all about, we want to equip you, empower you, and motivate you to have impact on your social circle of friends with the good news of the gospel. Right? We, we don't want you just to have influence on your friends on what you're going to do on the weekend or on what sporting team you're going to root for together. We want you to have you know, an internal impact on your group of friends and family members. And so you do that by sharing the good news of the gospel. And remember, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, and died for us so that we could enter into a relationship with him and have all of our sins forgiven, be given a new life, and be given heaven for all of eternity. And that's the good news, amen? And and that's what we want you to be sharing, not just hey, come to church with us, but also, this is why I go to church. It's where I connect with Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. Now, as a result of this series, we really want you to identify specifically one person in your life that you will begin to actively pray for, that you will share the gospel with, that you will invite to church. And at the end of this message, we have an interactive moment Uh, that is going to help you all solidify who is your one. Who is your one person that you need to go tell? So I look forward to leading you through that at the end of my message. But first, let's jump into God's word once again. Now, last week we launched this series with the question, why do we need to go tell? And it had a very simple answer. The answer was because Jesus said so. But we peel back the layers and I gave you these three points. I said, first of all, Jesus says it's our first priority that we go tell. He he tells us that it's a matter of life and death for people, so there's an urgency to it. And he also tells us that it's our job. The Great Commission is not a suggestion to disciples of Jesus, it is an assignment. Your job, despite that you might be a lawyer, you might be a school teacher, you might be a a fitness trainer, your job as a Christian is to make other disciples, to share the gospel, to teach others what you have found out and learned about in terms of Jesus. And so that's where we started last week. And I told you there's a series of questions. Well, this week's question is, who do we need to go tell? Like, Who specifically do we need to go tell this good news of the gospel? Well, like last week had kind of a basic answer. There's a basic answer for this question. And the answer is everyone. Who do we need to go tell? Everyone. Why is the answer everyone? Because everyone has a sin problem. That's why we're supposed to tell everyone because everybody has a problem that will lead to death and separation from God. And so everyone needs to hear the good news. I like how Paul says it in Romans chapter one, verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm gonna tell it, I'm gonna talk about it, I'm gonna proclaim it, I'm gonna preach it to anyone and anywhere that I go. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He says, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. You see, what he's saying there is it is. The gospel contains the story and the information that every lost, dying soul needs to come to grips with. And so he's not gonna be ashamed of of sharing that because it is sharing the gospel that opens up the door for a person to respond to Jesus. And when we respond to Jesus, it brings eternal life. Now, I want you to notice the last little phrase, though, in this sentence or in this verse, verse 16. 
He says, you know, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. What in the world does that mean? Well, this is an interesting little line that uh, requires a little bit of history for those of you that are new to the faith and maybe even for those of you that have been Christians for a while. It's really interesting how the idea that the gospel is for everyone wasn't actually fully understood in the very beginning, even by the disciples themselves. And, and what got it so confusing or what made it so confusing was there was actually a sequence that had to play out in order for everyone to actually be and mean everyone. So, so let me explain it to you this way. In terms of sequence of who was going to get the good news, like if you were on the ground living on planet Earth in the first century and Jesus, you could see him walking around teaching, and then he would end up going to the cross, dying, being buried, and then resurrected on the third day. Well, that good news right at that launching point was actually intended to be shared with the Jews and the Jews only. That's the, the ordained sequence that God had intended, that it would be shared that everyone would actually mean the Jews first. Now, it meant Jews first and then everybody else later, but it didn't mean this was an issue of equality. Now, in our day and age where everybody gets offended about everything and fairness is really a big issue, uh, a lot of people would say, that seems unfair. Like if it's for everyone, then it needs to be for everyone. But let me just remind you that when God creates everything and ordains what's going to happen, uh, we just have to submit to God's way of doing things. And so here's how God did it. He decided to choose a nation. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, he decided to make Israel his chosen people. And when he chose Israel, he said, look, here's how it's gonna work. I wanna be your God, you're gonna be my people. I'm gonna bless your socks off. I'm gonna make you a nation and everybody else is gonna be able to look at you and see that you're the best nation because I'm your Leader, I'm your God. They have false gods. And so I want to bless you by having a relationship with you, and then I want you all to bless everyone else. Now, the ultimate way that that actually plays out is that Jesus came, the Messiah came in the lineage of the Jewish people. He came through the Messianic line of David, right? And so that is the ultimate gift to everyone is that the Jewish people would produce the Messiah, if you will, and then the Messiah will be able to save everyone from their sins, okay? So I know that's a little technical, but it's just interesting because we say everyone, who do we tell everyone? Well, they didn't understand that even in the beginning, and part of it's because, so for example, by the way, Jesus says this, the Forgiveness of sin, repentance for the forgiveness of the sins uh, will be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So he taught things like that. Then when the disciples were sent out to go, you know, share the gospel, do you know where they were instructed to go first and always go first? Does anybody know? They go to any new town, any new little village, any new area, they would immediately go where? I hear somebody saying it to the synagogues, because the Jews were supposed to get the news first. So that kind of implanted in their mind that it was Jews only, Jews only, not everyone else. They didn't tell it to other people, they only told it to the Jews, but that's not what God wanted. He just wanted it to start with the Jews. Now, it wasn't until Peter had a special vision that it became clear to all the disciples that everyone actually really meant everyone. And you say, well, how would they be confused? You told us last week that Jesus sat them down at the Great Commission and said, go into all the world, right? Go into all the world, all world. Those are pretty definitive concepts, right? And then in Acts, he talks about, look, man, you're supposed to 
to go and you start here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth with this good news. Well, that sounds like everybody. How would they be confused? Well, this just points to the uh, reality of how ingrained it was in the Jewish people that, that they you know, were, were right and they were good and they were the chosen people and that everybody else was, was wrong and they were bad and they were Gentiles and they had rules that they didn't even interact with the Gentiles. So these, remember, I've told you time and time again, these disciples were young and often kind of knuckleheads and people seem to be nervous about that, but it's a reality. You and I are knuckleheads a lot of times as well. We have hard heads that make us very stubborn and we don't pay attention. And these guys, it, it required this supernatural encounter with God for them to understand that everyone meant even people who aren't Jews. Now let me just, I don't have time to get into this story deep, but I want you to read it on your own. But turn over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And I want you to read this whole chapter on your own this week and even the next. It's fascinating. You'll love the reading, uh, but check it out. But let me kind of summarize where this exchange happened or where this new revelation happened that everyone meant everyone. So here's your, your first character. His name is Cornelius. He's a, a, a guard, a, cent, a cent, centurion soldier. He's an Italian. He's not Jewish, but he's a God-fearing Gentile. Which, which means this guy recognized there had to be a God and wanted to serve God and live for God, but he didn't have all the rules and he didn't have all the understanding that, that he needed to have. So one day it says he has a vision. He has a vision and an angel of the Lord shows up to him and says, hey, you need to go send some people for a guy by the name of Peter. You just go send for him and you need to listen to what he has to say. And so Cornelius goes, okay. I've had a vision, and he sends his guys off to find Peter. Well, about the same time, actually, the next day at noon, it says Peter has a vision. Peter is on a roof waiting for some lunch. He's tired. He kind of falls asleep, and then a voice starts to lead him through a vision. In his vision, here's what Peter sees. He sees a giant sheet coming down from heaven. And there's something in it. And as it gets in front of him, it unfolds and he sees all kinds of four-legged animals, birds and reptiles contained in the sheep. It's a vision. Now, he sees this and then hears audibly from a voice from God that says, kill and eat. <laughs> and Peter's response is, is kind of interesting. He, he says, uh, surely not, Lord. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. In other words, as a good Jewish boy, Peter is saying, ah, that's not kosher, right? Like these are the, the animals that we're not supposed to eat. There are rules. You established them. I never eat this kind of stuff. I'm not eating this stuff. Well, then the angel, or it didn't say angel, it just says a voice. It says, then the voice said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So now remember, this is just a vision. What does that mean? Well, if he's unsure what just went down, it says that this actually happens three times. When something happens three times, that gives you the space and the and the. Uh, awareness to go, okay, this must be pretty important. So he now has this new concept that's weird about animals, kill and eat, and don't say they're impure or unclean. If I've said they are now clean. Now, what does he do with that? Well, about that time, the dudes that Cornelius sent to Peter show up and they're like, hey, are you Peter? Uh, you know, my boss wants to talk to you. And Peter's like, okay, this has been a pretty weird day. I just had this weird vision with animals and a sheet and uh, God's voice or some kind of angelic voice speaking to me. Uh, okay, I'm down for that. Where, 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 where are we going, All right? So Peter then heads off to Cornelius' house where Cornelius has got a bunch of Gentiles in a room 
waiting for a guy they don't know, but they had a vision. You know, Cornelius had this vision to send for. It's a very interesting situation. Peter shows up at this house, and as he gets started, listen to what he says. Talk about an an opener, you know, for a a guy that's going to, you know, preach the gospel. He begins this way. Look at verse 28 and 29 of Acts chapter 10. He said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or even visit a Gentile, right? Like, you're aware that we think you all are dirty people, is basically what he's saying. You're aware that we think we're better than you, right? I'm not even supposed to be in your house. You're so insignificant. Now, again, that's not what he's saying, but isn't it what he's saying? Basically, he's saying, there's, a, there's rules here. We don't associate, And so that's where he starts, but then he says, but God has shown me, and this is where he's connecting the dots, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. He makes the leap from the animal analogy over to these individuals. So when I was first sent for, I came without raising objections. Normally, I would have said, no, I'm not going to come and bring the good news to you because I'm supposed to bring it to the Jews. But I've learned something today. And then he says, basically, so what am I here for? What, like, you got to have a question? What's going on? Well, then Cornelius says, you know, what, what he says. He says, like, hey, I had a vision, and I don't know really what you're here for, but the Lord told me to send for you, and so uh, I don't know. What you tell me, what am I supposed to know? It's that kind of a conversation. Well, in Acts 10, 34 through 35, as Peter now begins, he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. He's acknowledging, kind of, that we misread this. Yes, there was a priority that it went to the Jews first, and they're gonna continue when they go into a town to go to the Jews first, but they're going to also tell anyone and everyone. And so at the end of this, it's a remarkable day because he, he then preaches the gospel to them. He actually starts and he just says, and you can read it this week on your own. He's like, look, man, I, let me tell you about this guy that I used to hang out with and what happened. I am a firsthand eyewitness of, of what Jesus said and what he did on the cross and what this all means. And he told them and everybody in the house that heard was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, Peter's like, we gotta get these people baptized. And it was a remarkable day with a room full of Gentiles becoming Christ followers. Now, everyone finally actually meant everyone, even to the disciples. And this is why we know the answer is to the question, who do we need to go tell? We need to tell everyone. But everyone is pretty overwhelming, right? Everyone is is a lot. So I want to get a little bit more specific for you and I in this room. We know that the gospel is for everyone, but but what, what, what do we need to know more as we peel back those layers? Practically speaking, what could we learn from Scripture to help us actually share the gospel? And that's what I want to walk you through next. So I want you to write these three categories down, and this would be an answer, a more detailed answer to who do we need to go tell? Number one, go tell the people who haven't heard Go tell the people who haven't heard. That is your your assignment, to go tell the people who haven't heard. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, Paul writes this. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice the word, everyone. Doesn't say just the Jews. Doesn't just say nice people. Doesn't just say white people. It doesn't just say, you know, some segmented group. It says Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now listen to his process as he goes forward in the next few verses. He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. See, Paul is saying, look, we have been commissioned by the Lord to go and tell. And we're supposed to tell everyone. And and the reason we have to tell everyone is a person who is far from God, who doesn't know the good news, has no inclination to even know to ask about the solution that is available to everyone. So how will they know unless somebody goes and tells them? And how will anyone go and tell unless like a preacher stands up and reminds them that this is your job? You tracking? Right? We're not just making this stuff up out of thin air. This is all coming from scripture. And so this is what you need to understand when you think about everyone. I mean, we gotta go tell the people who haven't heard. They need to hear. This is the core Uh, idea of missionary work, right? I mean, you know what a missionary does, and you kind of think a missionary, you know, gets on an airplane and goes to uh, the, the, the bush country of Africa, deep into the bush, or they go to the Amazon, deep into the jungle, and they find some isolated people group who have no way of ever hearing anything about the gospel. And that's where mission work began. The, the guy who modeled how to do missionary work wrote Romans chapter 10. Paul wrote that. And Paul was the guy that would get on a boat and go to a place where people had no idea anything about God or Jesus. But here's the thing. Something has changed over the years during my lifetime. It used to be that I would preach and say, you know, we got to do mission work. We got to do mission work because there are people that don't know. And they are the ones who have never heard And I would even go as far to say, like, you can't live in America and not know about Jesus. You can't live in America and not have been exposed to Jesus. And so if America is going to reject Jesus, let's go to places who have never even had the opportunity to reject. That's, that's ripe fruit, ready to be picked, right? Let's go tell them. That was kind of a, a mindset. But do you know what has changed just in my lifetime? I think now there are people in America who don't know who Jesus is. They have no knowledge of Jesus because their family, you know, didn't have any knowledge of Jesus and rejected Jesus. And then there was a generation that was able to reject Jesus their whole life. And, and then the next generation, you know, is, is now like got parents who know nothing about the Lord and They are more distracted with information about everything available to them in the world. They, they do not actually have any, some have some, but it's inaccurate information about Jesus. I think there are some pockets of people in America who, who have no idea about the gospel. And I don't know that that was true in the 50s and in the 60s and the 70s because Christianity was so dominant and so widely accepted. You really would have had to go out of your way to be like in a vacuum, but not anymore because that's how far our society has fallen. Now, those of you, I'm 47, raise your hand if you're older, 47 or older, raise your hand. You all know what I'm talking about, right? And, and, and anyone younger may not know what I'm talking about. All I am saying now is, you know, it's not just missionary work in Africa when it comes to, we got to tell people who haven't heard. You got people all around you who haven't heard and we need to start with them. Number two, you need to go tell people who ask. You need to go tell people who ask. This one almost, you know, comes up to you. This isn't a situation that you have to discern or go figure out. This is a person that comes up to you and, and asks you to tell them. Listen to what uh, Peter writes in Verse 15 of chapter three. First Peter chapter three, verse 15. Remember, this is the saint, the guy writing what I'm about to read to you is the guy that had the vision and went and realized that even the Gentiles should be told. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I mean, it was a good thing that Peter was ready and prepared to give the reason for the hope that he had. I mean, he had a weird vision. He gets, you know, invited to go to somebody's house that he's normally not even supposed to walk into. He walks in. They say, hey, 
we're all here. We want to hear about God. Tell us. And he's like, oh, okay. I'm happy to tell you. I hung out with this guy. He said all kinds of things. He made all kinds of claims. And then I watched him get strung up on a cross. In fact, I ran scared when they arrested him. I denied even knowing him. I mean, he went into his story because he knew his story because he knew what Jesus had done in his life. Now listen, you've got to be ready with an answer to be able to communicate the good news to someone. If the carpet, red carpet's rolled out for you, if you're given the green light by someone and they say, hey, I've been watching you, I've been observing you, I've noticed how you've navigated all these things that are going on in the world lately, and I'm just curious, why? Well, that's an open door for you to say, oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Now, after you say, I'm glad you asked, and you begin to share the good news, do you even know what to say? Or like, could you only get out, uh, so, like, Jesus, uh, he, Jesus, you know, I mean, would you like get paralyzed? Or would you be able to say, oh man, let me tell you. And would you be able to captivate their attention with a story about what Jesus did in your life? Now, I don't wanna drill down too deep on this because this is next week's message. Next week's message is simply, you are in the conversation, you are telling someone about Jesus, what exactly do you say? Because everybody gets overwhelmed with that, everybody's confused by, like they think you've gotta have some kind of a you know, background in theology or a, you know, a degree of some kind, and that's not the case. So next week, we're gonna talk specifically about that. So I don't wanna go any further, but I want you to know you gotta go tell the people who haven't heard, but you also have to tell the people who ask, and you need to be thankful that that kind of door is open up to you. And you need to be ready to pounce on that opportunity why? Because lives are at stake. Lives are at stake. All right, number three. Go tell the people who don't ask. This one's a little, I'm turning this one on its head, right? Go tell the people who don't ask. Now, I put on my notes a little in parentheses, there are conditions here. This is with conditions, and let me explain this. Because by me saying, go tell the people who don't ask, I'm not suggesting to go purchase a bullhorn and to go stand on the corner of Telegraph and 255 on the entrance to the highway and just start telling people the good news. And some of you are like, but I'd love to do that. Well, I mean, you can do that. I'm just not sure that that's the most effective use of your time, to yell at someone on a bullhorn for 30 seconds as they drive by. There's this meme on Instagram that just jumped in my head, and I'm gonna say it, and most of you are gonna think, what is he talking about? But there's gonna be somebody out here. It just reminded me of the meme that always shows the animals running away, and it says, don't run away from the Lord. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's just me. Like five people know what I'm talking about. Oh, that meme cracks me up every time I see it. Anyway, random rabbit trail. So don't go buy a bull, don't, don't go grab a bullhorn and start yelling. I'm not a fan of tracks. You've heard me say that a million times, and I've now realized that a lot of people, the 47 and younger crowd has never been to an airport where people are handing out tracts. 47 and older, like back in the 60s and 70s, there were a bunch of weird peace, like, you know, hippie smoking people passing out tracts, and then Christians would do it too, and like you'd get off an airplane and people would hand you stuff. That doesn't happen anymore for good reason. It doesn't work, okay? So I'm not suggesting that, but here's a dangerous pendulum swing. Don't grab a bullhorn, don't hand out a track to a com complete stranger, uh, and then that means like never tell anyone unless they ask. That's too far. There has to be room for the Holy Spirit to prompt you to tell you to take this opportunity and speak to this person who's not asked about Jesus. And this is awkward, and this is potentially dangerous, and this is, you know, where I think some people go, it's black and white, and so you never, you know, don't use a bullhorn, and that means you never talk to anyone that doesn't ask. I don't think that's accurate, and here's why I would say that. Because you all have friends and family 
who certainly will never ask you to talk about religion or faith, spiritual things or Jesus. Amen? So raise your hand. If you have people in your family that have made it very clear to you they do not want to hear your opinions on that stuff, raise your hand. Just show everybody so everyone can relate to each other. Now here's the question. They've not asked. They're not gonna ask. And you love them. Should we never attempt to have the conversation anyway? I mean, what about the urgency of there are lives at stake and these lives happen to be your loved ones and your friends. They're gonna go to hell if they do not accept Jesus. Is there room for you to at least care enough to take an opportunity that that might not go perfect, but to at least definitively at one point say, I know you haven't ever asked and I know you kind of sent the vibes that you don't care, but I love you so much, I'm going to say something and then, you know, I get you don't have to agree with it, but I have got to share it with you. See, we don't want the pendulum to swing so far that like no bullhorns means you only tell people who say, please tell me about Jesus, I'm dying to know. You see, there's the bulk of your actual going and telling isn't gonna happen in point number two, right? It's not gonna even happen in point number one. Not everybody's getting on a plane and going to a mission field and not everyone's like going to certain pockets of America and like cutting a path into a completely, you know, uh, non-God-fearing culture. I mean, most people kind of are busy going to work and doing life and so the bulk of your going and telling is actually going to be the people in your social circles that don't ask, but you love and you don't wanna see them separated from God for all of eternity. And so yes, I do think it's worth the risk. And yes, I do think it's careful how you do it. And yes, there will be some people that take that and go, I'm gonna walk up to people randomly and say, the Lord has laid it on my heart to talk to you and you about Jesus and you're in a grocery store and the person looks at you like you're an idiot and nothing good comes from the conversation. And that's why you gotta be wise and you gotta make sure that the spirit is leading you and you're not just kind of excited to do something, right? And if you do though, kind of step over that barrier and they've not asked, and now you're in the conversation, and you're about to roll into it, did you know that Jesus actually gives you a couple of tips to be watching for in the conversation so that you can back off, and it doesn't go crazy, and it doesn't go south? Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, uh, you're gonna know it now. I want you to look at two passages in Matthew, Matthew chapter seven and Matthew chapter 10. You're in the conversation, and things seem to get a little bit awkward. Here's advice. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Matthew chapter seven, verse six. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about a thing of value. When you take a thing of value and present it to something or someone that does not see its intrinsic value, they will not treat it with value, right? If you, you get into a pig pen with a pig and go, look at these gorgeous pearls, they're so valuable, the pig will probably try to eat them and in the process, bite your hand off because the pig doesn't understand that these pearls have value, right? And so what Jesus is saying He's not trying to be insulting and call anyone a dog or a pig. So you gotta be careful when you quote this verse. Like when things aren't going good in a conversation, you don't go, oh, well, you're a dog and a pig. Jesus said, I gotta watch out for people like you, right? That wouldn't be what you would say. It's a principle. And the principle here is something of value presented to people who don't see the value. So Jesus is saying, look, man, The gospel and the good news, if you're trying to share it with someone and they have no desire 
to be with God. They don't want to know God. They don't want to hear about God. In fact, they're against God. You need to just back off of that because that conversation is not going to go well. It's not going to go well. So that, that's your cue. Back off. Now, in verse 10, or chapter 10, he says something else. Jesus says to his disciples, he's assigned them, I want you to go two by two, house by house, and start telling people the good news. And he says this instruction. If anyone will not welcome you, and by the way, this is, start with the Jews. He's going to all the Jews, all the Jews' houses, to say, hey, we're all Jewish. We've all been looking for the Messiah. Well, the Messiah is here, and can I tell you about him? Jesus says, if they won't welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than on that town. Jesus is saying, look, I want you to go tell people, but if those people do not wanna listen to you, shake the dust off your feet. What does that mean? That phrase meant recognize at that point you have no responsibility. You get to shake the dust off your feet because you've done what you've been told to do. You've, been, you've done what you've been commissioned to do. You've told them, and now you get to walk away knowing that it wasn't that they're gonna go to hell because you didn't tell them. They're gonna go to hell because they've chosen to reject the truth. Now that's, again, that, that's, you know, some people are like, oh, it's so harsh, you know. It's harsh to tell someone that God loved you so much that he did all the work for you. You don't have to do anything and he'll solve your problem for you. But if you reject him, he's gonna give you exactly what you want, eternity separated from him. That's harsh. Seems very logical to me. And so, Shake the dust off your feet means you, you don't have to worry. You don't have to force the conversation. You don't have to take a crowbar and say, you're gonna let me in this house and I am gonna baptize you before this day is over. I will Google 10 articles and prove you wrong, right? That, that's not what you gotta do. It, you gotta go, look, man, I tried. But keep in mind, there's somebody in the house down the street that might open the door wide open and say, come on in and tell me. And you're wasting time throwing pearls to pigs. That doesn't mean they are, we, we call a person a pig, but it means there's a concept there. So Jesus says, look, and, and it's not gonna go well for them, unfortunately, if they do reject this news. And so you move on. So isn't that awesome that, that Jesus even makes it clear to us, we have this assignment, he's gonna go with us, I'll be with you, Always, he says, as you go and tell, so you're not gonna be in this alone uh, and you have a responsibility to tell, but then there is a place where you are no longer responsible. You tell the information, but you don't get to control that they receive the information and you move along. What I think the genius of this is, is it shows that we do need to be urgent and take the risk and have the conversation even though someone doesn't ask. But the moment we see that they are not interested, we don't need to double down and amp up and get into conflict. We need to back off and move along. As simple as that. Now, those three ideas help you with the basic concept a little bit better of everyone. You at least have it narrowing to, okay, what does this mean for me, but everyone still can be so overwhelming that you actually tell no one. And that would be what would be absolutely, you know, a terrible scenario, is that you know that you're supposed to tell everyone, but everyone is so overwhelming that you tell no one. And I think a lot of people fall into that category. Everyone, I'm supposed to tell everyone, but they tell no one. You do not wanna get to the end of your life and know that you have been saved by grace and you didn't pass that on to anyone else. And for that reason, they may potentially not spend eternity in heaven. There is a huge responsibility here. But action is required. Action is required. So we've got to move this from our heart and our head to action. And that's what I want to do here at the end of the service. I want to call you 
to action. You know, yes, we need to go tell the people who haven't heard. And yes, we need to tell the people who ask us to tell them. We, we need to tell the people who don't ask. But we need to actually tell someone today. We can't just keep theorizing what those scenarios will be. And so can I just tell you very clearly and blatantly where you need to start right now, you need to go tell the people that you know and that know you. You gotta start by telling the people that you know and know you. Not like if somebody comes up to you and asks in six weeks, not like I'm I'm gonna go up to a complete stranger and have this conversation and trust that the Lord's gonna guide me through it. No, you need to start with the people that you know and the people that know you. And the reason I say that is to reiterate the point that we learned last week. From the guy that's possessed with a number of demons, he's referred to as Legion, or he referred to himself as Legion, the demons said that, right? And he, he is naked, cutting himself, screaming, living among dead people in tombs, in chains because his community has tried to isolate him because he's a madman. When that guy meets Jesus and he has an epic transformation, I told you last week the story, he goes over to Jesus as Jesus is getting into the boat to leave and he says, Jesus, can I go with you? I wanna hang out with you more. You've changed my life. This is amazing. Let's have coffee. And Jesus says, "Uh, no, you can't go with me. I don't want you to spend more time with me. I'd rather you go Tell the people in your hometown what God has done for you. Why did Jesus say that? Well, we talked about it last week, but let me just reiterate it. I think he said that because there's no more powerful testimony than when you walk and interact with people that you know and know you because if Jesus has done a miracle in your life and saved you by grace, it will be visibly obvious because you will have died to your old self and been born to walk in a new life and you will be a completely different person. And all the people that interacted with this man who had been possessed by a demon were able to say, you've been nuts and out of your mind for the last five years, 10 years, 15 years. I've warned my kids to stay away from you. And yet now you are fully dressed. You're in your right mind. You're clear. You're, you're smart. You're kind. You're conscientious. Something has happened. What happened? And he gets to say, I met a man who in one second healed me. And that's where the story gets passed on and on and on and on. And there is validity to the story because they know you and they know how messed up you were. And that's why it's so important for you to start with the people that you know and that know you and you've got to start today. And so, here's your call to action. The worship team is gonna come out in a moment and they're gonna sing one more song which will give you the opportunity to worship and actually start committing to who that one person is. Not start committing, but commit. And so you may notice on the, on the tables up here, there's ping pong balls over here and ping pong balls on this table over here and there's a table back here and back here. So everybody can go to a place that's not crowded. And I want you to grab a ping pong ball and a marker. And I want you to put to print the name of the person that God has laid on your heart because you already know who that person is. That person in your life that you know or knows you who you know they're struggling, you know they're lost, you know they're hurting, you know they're addicted, you know they're making choices that just continue to compound more sin and more regret and more shame in their life. You see them falling apart and they don't have what you have and you want them to have what you have. What is their name? And I want you to write it on a ping pong ball. And by writing it, you're kind of solidifying, this is the person that I'm praying for. This is the person, God, that I am going to look for the opportunity to speak with and talk to and invite them to church. I'm not just kind of gonna be aware that we need to go tell everyone. I'm gonna tell at least one. And that's the name. Now, you might have more than one, but it's gotta be at least one. And so we want you to grab these ping pong balls and then uh, I'm gonna pray and We're gonna put a huge container up here. Actually, there's like three of them. And you can put them in any of the three containers. 
These just are, you know, all the, the three services that we're doing. People on Thursday already started this process. We're then going to combine all the containers and, and make one display out in the lobby as a reminder to our church who is our one that we are praying for and that we're going and that we're telling. This is so important. Lives are at stake. So please take this time to worship and to pray and to make your way up and to grab these ping pong balls and then to come up and place them in the containers that will be sitting right here. This is an important time and I hope that you will take it serious. And so let's pray right now as we enter into this time. Father, thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done and the stories that you have told us and taught us. Thank you for being a God that is patient that is kind, that is loving. You did all the hard work. You've opened the door. You've carved the path. And so now I just pray that you would help the right names come to mind, the right names be written out. You already know how it's all gonna go down, Father, but you invite us into the process. For whatever reason, you've entrusted this job to us. And so help us carry it out right now in this moment of worship as we give you this time and as we process through these names. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen.